I'll take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And we continue our journey in this book that speaks to the superiority of Christ. And I'll, I'll tell you again that even as I'm working through these sermons, you know, my goal was not to preach verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. Um, Hebrews is a book that deserves to be preached through verse by verse, as, as does all of the Word of God. Um, Hebrews is particularly, I think, <clears throat> Um, challenging in a lot of ways, but the uh, in these days of approaching our celebration of Christmas, the the celebration of the incarnation of Christ, and we will even see today in this particular text multiple mentions of the fact that Jesus is, is God who has taken on flesh, and the intention in these days is to for us to be able to see the beauty of Christ together, um, <clears throat> as. As I relax in the evenings, sometimes I, I enjoy watching Shark Tank. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. It's basically this show where a bunch of rich people uh, kind of sit there and, and, and a, a budding young entrepreneur comes in and they talk about their business and their plans and, and they're trying to get these guys to give them money so they can continue their plans on into the future. And sometimes <clears throat> it's a really good idea and it, and it's, it's a business with substance, and so the, somebody will give them a bunch of money, and they, then they'll go on and, and move out into the future um, together. Sometimes, though, they, <clears throat> they laugh them out of the building. They ridicule their idea. Their, their idea has no substance and no sustainability. They see no reason in investing their money because they have no real assurance of any substantial return on that investment. Now, in the days that we move into Thanksgiving and the celebration of Christmas, we'll hear more and more people talking about joy and thankfulness and celebration and peace and hope for the future and those kinds of things. But I wonder if there's really any substance to that. I wonder if there's any sustainability, any hope for real return on their investment, if you will, for the future as they think about those things. I believe that our, our only sustainable, substantial hope is in seeing more and more clearly the person and work of Jesus Christ, loving him more as a result of that, and finding our support and sustaining and provision and nurturing and life in Him. And so that's why I'm excited about working through these texts and this one in particular, which I think communicates to us that all of time is held in the hands of Jesus. And I'd like for you to pick up with me in the, the early part of chapter 2 and verse 5. As we are hearing again another assertion that Jesus is superior in particular to the angels. And you'll remember that in the, amongst the Hebrews of this day, there was a sect that um, set forth an idea that in the, the day to come, the age to come, um, so beyond, beyond the second coming of Christ that Todd just mentioned a moment ago, in this, in this age to come, that there would be angelic figures to whom the Messiah was um, subjugated or uh, inferior. And that this angelic figure would rule in the kingdom to come. And so he, has, he spends a substantial part of the book saying, no, there are no angels to whom Jesus is inferior. Jesus is the one who will rule. It's not to angels, he says in the beginning of, of chapter 2, that God subjects all things in the kingdom to come, but it's to Christ. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, 
What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of God. Now again, that's a long text, and you could spend many, many weeks thinking about all of the rich truths of Christ that are there. But I'd like for us to think about that larger text in these three ways. First of all, the fact that Jesus has reversed the curse of the past. All my failures in Christ are reversed. Secondly, my future glory is secured by Christ. And then finally, my present pilgrimage is sustained by Christ. So, the failure from the past that haunts me and the sin that condemned me is reversed. The future that I long for is secured. And the present struggle that I face is sustained by Jesus Christ and by Him alone. So as we think about those things, let's think first of all about the way that Jesus reverses our past failures. The, the text, as I said, begins with this statement about the superiority of Jesus to the angels that God is subjecting the world to come to Jesus, not to angels. And then he supports that claim by quoting from Old Testament texts. And the text from which he quotes is Psalm 8. Now, this New Testament text is going to help us understand what's going on in Psalm 8. But before we look there, we need to, to see what Psalm 8 is referring to in its first sense, and that is Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to ask you to turn and look back with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and following. Psalm 8, as the Psalms often do, refers to something before them in the Old Testament. And Psalm chapter 8 refers to Genesis 1, and in Genesis 1.26, we read this. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now in that text, we're reminded that when God created man, Adam and Eve were God's people, 
in God's place, the garden, obeying God's purposes or fulfilling God's purposes and designs. They were put there in the garden as it were God's representatives to carry out and fulfill God's design for the world, which was to, to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and to rule over the, the earth. All that was on the earth was under their authority. And we see that then as we go back into Hebrews chapter 2, looking back towards Psalm 8, which speaks of the dignity and the place of man in God's world. The problem is that Adam failed. Adam and Eve were God's people in God's place, doing or carrying out God's purposes, but they failed. And because of their failure, they brought themselves and the world, including you and me, under the curse. And so we, in Adam, are failures. We have not obeyed God's law. We have not kept God's purposes. We've not fulfilled God's intentions that are described back there in Genesis chapter 1. Um, and we'll talk about that some more as we move along this morning. But the thing that I want you to see is that while Psalm 8, looking back to that, recognizes the dignity and the intention of God for man to be God's person or people under God's rule and reign in God's place, carrying out God's design, that he has a, a level of dignity and place in the world, he has not kept that. So now what Hebrews chapter 2 is telling us is that Jesus is the one who fulfills God's intentions for man. So as it looks back to Psalm chapter 8, it's saying the fuller sense, if you will, of what Psalm 8 is talking about is Jesus. And we understand that because in verse 8 of Hebrews 2, I'm sorry, in verse 9, he refers to Psalm 8 again. But we see him who was for a little while made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So does Psalm 8 in its initial sense speak about us in a general sense and our dignity and our place in the creation? Yes. But in its fuller sense, it is speaking to the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the fact that he is the one who was for a little while lower than the angels but has now been crowned with glory and honor, everything having been put in subjection under his feet. He is the one who reverses the curse that fell on Adam and as a result of our being in Adam on us. He is the one who takes that failure and reverses it. He is the one who fulfills the promise, as I've said multiple times, he's the one who fulfills the promise of Genesis 3.15. He is the man, the seed of the woman, who through his suffering crushes the head of the serpent. Now, in this text and in multiple places, we learn about the incarnation of Jesus, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. And if I can just say something parenthetical about Christmas, I have this love-hate affair with Christmas, you know, because it's like celebratory and fun and everything like that, but it gets so distorted by the commercialism and the... The if I don't get what I want, I'm unhappy and I go into huge debt trying to get what you want and, and all that stuff that goes on around it. And it feels like we miss the entire reason for the celebration. You know, when somebody puts those signs in their yards and say, Jesus is the reason for the season, I just want to knock on their door and say, what do you mean? <laughs> what, what do you even mean by that? And so, friends, I'm asking you if you have real reason and substance to celebrate the coming of Christ, if you understand that his coming in the flesh means that the curse that was on you and the condemnation that was due to you is reversed in him and in his work and person as a man. The, the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 is bound up in him. 
That's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So if you had any kind of wonder about what I said earlier, you are indeed, apart from Christ, under condemnation, when you are born because you are in Adam. He is your representative. But the good news in verse 17 of Romans 5 is because of one man's, if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so the great substance of our joy as we celebrate Christmas and we anticipate celebrating the birth of Christ is that in Christ, the failure of Adam is reversed and so is ours. So we are not those who have to walk around under the weight of the condemnation of parenting that we've done badly or spousing that we've done badly or employing or employering that we've done badly or sinfully or our interpersonal relationships or the sins we've committed. Those things are taken away because Jesus reverses the failure of Adam, the man, Jesus Christ. And all of that is done through his suffering and death. Look at verse 9. We see him for a little while was lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. So there's the intention. The intention of God for the man, Adam, was that he would be crowned with glory and honor <coughs> Excuse me, and that he would reign and live forever in glory and honor. But in his failure, that is lost. But Jesus is the one who is now crowned with glory and honor because he has reversed the curse. And he's done that because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So, what Adam failed to do... Jesus does. You were under condemnation by the failure of one man, so by the obedience and the perfection of Christ and the death, the penalty that was paid for sin in his death, all of that has been taken care of. And not only is Adam's failure taken away, but all that is reversed because you are in Christ. All that you have done in disobedience and rebellion against God because you were born in Adam is reversed. And by the works of righteousness that Jesus has done, you are righteous. Not by works of righteousness that you have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. What a great Savior. All of the curse of the past is reversed. But not only that. There's more reason to rejoice because Jesus secures our future glory. Look at verses 10 through 13 with me. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory. So there's the reason I, I say there's glory coming. Because the text says Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. That speaks of us as those who are in Christ. He is bringing many sons to glory, um, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now I want to explain, explain the phrase, the founder of our salvation. Another word would be pioneer. Um, and a, a really good way to understand this phrase or this, the meaning of this word is someone who has or who is both the source of our faith and the one who brings those he saves to the intended goal. So not only is Jesus the one who secures salvation, but he is the one who brings his people to the end of their salvation. And that is eternal glory with him. And this he did, again, through his suffering. And I want to explain just that phrase, perfect through suffering. 
it doesn't mean that Jesus was lacking something that was somehow made up in his character, but that he was the perfect one to stand in our place. And he was perfectly... Um, Now I can't, I'm having a senior moment, y'all. Um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Qualified to stand in our place. He was perfectly qualified to stand in our place. So the one who went to the cross was perfectly qualified. And his perfection is manifested in that he has not only established for us salvation, but brings us to the end of that. Now, he, the author of Hebrews now calls us to hope in this future glory by quoting again from Old Testament texts. And he said, we can have this hope patterned after the very hope of Christ and we can hope to be those who he calls brothers. And he quotes then from Psalm 22. Now Psalm 22, as he quotes from it, he says, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of your congregation. I will sing your praise. Psalm 22 is one of the most easily recognized messianic psalms in, the old, in the, all of the psalms. It, it begins this way, you'll remember. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It goes on to speak of those who gather around the cross of Christ to mock him and to spit at him. It speaks of how he can see all his bones and yet not one of them is broken. And it spends this elaborate section of the text talking about the horrific nature of the death of Christ on the cross. And yet it then also turns in this hopeful expression, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Then he goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 8, which is again a text that in its bigger context is rooted in a situation of sorrow and suffering of the people of Israel. And yet, in that text they are saying, I will put my trust in him and behold, I am and the children God has given me. And so, we see Jesus, these words being put into the mouth of Jesus, in the process of suffering and dying as the Redeemer. One who is trusting in the Lord that this is the pathway to glory. And that God will indeed supply to him everything that has been promised. And he believes that he will supply us to him, the children God has given him. So, we're being called to trust, trust in Christ, to reverse the curse, and to bring to nothing the sins of our past. We're to look to him in rejoicing in that he has rendered the power of Satan null and void. The victory that is achieved through Jesus' death sets us free from the past failure of Adam and secures our entrance into heaven. And so we can anticipate with a real substantial joy and we can celebrate with not propping our hope up with artificial coming and going kinds of things, but we can, we can have substantial celebration that Jesus will bring us to the end. Because those whom he predestined he also called, and those whom he called he also justified, and those whom he justified he also glorified. Now I've, I've ordered things this way because just as Jesus was walking through the days of suffering and the horrific nature of the cross, so we walk through days of difficulty, but we anticipate the glory that's to come. But then also we are sustained now by his provision. And that's the third thing I want us to see in this text. Jesus preserves our present pilgrimage. Now in verse 8, um, we notice that the author says that everything has been put in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. 
At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. And I think we would like look at, at 2020 and go, no duh, right? It's not hard to look around and recognize that everything is not in subjection, at least from our perspective. It looks like, and the reality of our experience is, that sin and brokenness is still active. This is that already not yet reality that we talk about a lot around here. That Jesus is truly ruling and reigning over all things. And yet his kingdom has not come to its full consummation. That you really are justified, holy, redeemed, righteous. And yet the full work of God's saving power has not been realized in our lives. So, in the meantime... We are to hope in Christ to sustain us and provide for us in this journey. Now, notice in verse 14 that he has been made like us in every respect. He has partaken of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There again is that promise that will be delivered on the other end. But then I want you to focus in on verse 18 with me. I'm sorry, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that, what's the the product? What's produced? What's the, the logical outcome of that? So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. And then in verse 18, He has suffered and been tempted, and he is able to help those who are tempted. I want us to think about those three things. Jesus, the merciful high priest. Jesus, the faithful high priest. And Jesus, the one who helps us when we're tempted. First of all, Jesus is full of mercy. I want to borrow from Dane Ortland's little book, Gentle and Lowly, and I agree with him when he says that we have a tendency to think that when Jesus is exposed to our sin, our sinfulness, that he's repulsed by that. Sort of like he uses the illustration of a little boy who comes into contact with a snail, you know, for the very first time. And I don't know if you've ever done that before. I I remember finding snails crawling around at our house when I was a boy and you know, you're interested and curious, but you, you don't want to actually get up there close. And if you actually do touch it, it's like squishy and gooey. And it secretes this oozy, gooey stuff. And it just kind of makes you want to go get like this, right? And we tend to think that that's Jesus' reaction to us as sinners. That he might come near a little bit, but then... When he gets up close and personal to it, he just goes, ugh, like that. And he's repulsed by your sin. And you think, why would the one who hung the stars in place want to get near to me anyway? Why would he who is holy and perfect and righteous want to get near to me? Because I know I'm a sinner. I, I know that. Friends, The testimony of Scripture is this. Over and over again, we see Jesus moved with compassion on crowds and individuals, all of them sinners. He feeds the hungry. He touches the lame. He heals the blind. He takes those who are afflicted with leprosy and he heals them. He touches the body of a dead little girl and she's brought back to life. He moves toward those who are broken by their sin. And he does it in compassion and mercy. He alone has the very thing that they and we most desperately need. He has life for those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. He eats with sinners. He converses with sinners. He asks a sinful woman for a drink. There is never an instance in Scripture... When we see a needy sinner 
having to overcome reluctance in Jesus. When needy sinners come to Christ, He is moved towards them in compassion and mercy. When Jesus stands outside the tomb of Lazarus, in John chapter 11, we read that Jesus was moved with compassion. Some have said that that means that Jesus was just so sorry that this had happened to Lazarus and that Martha and Mary were enduring this sorrow. And I suppose there is a sense in which that is right, but the word that's translated, he was deeply moved, in its original sense means he was angry. And you could almost translate that text and says, when Jesus saw what sin had wrought, he snorted. And in my ima imagination, in my contemplation of that text, I see Jesus saying, not for long, because soon I will give myself at the cross and sin and death will be crushed. And I think Jesus hates the effect of sin and the damage it causes and just like I would run to my child who had felt the horrific effects of a bike wreck you know and I'm running I'm running to them to help them in their time of need Jesus is oriented to you sinner he is running to you in compassion and mercy and kindness to relieve you of the effects of the sin that he hates Now, I do need to qualify this, and I appreciate the way Dane Ortland does this in his book. And he says, I, I believe this is a quote, Jesus is merciful, but he's not mushy. And so I do have this warning for you, that Jesus does not excuse those who are unrepentant with regard to their sin. When the hypocritical religious leaders denounced him, he stood and pronounced woes against them. He defies the self-righteous and he promises judgment to those who refuse to repent. He makes no room for those who think themselves basically good. There is no room at the table for those who try to enter the banquet on their own merit. For those who need no physician and stiff arm him, he will leave you to die in your own unrecognized disease. He calls you to come to him on his terms and to take up your cross and follow him every day. But as you do, he is moved to you in compassion. And so I would urge you, sinner, repent and believe the gospel today. Receive this Christ who is oriented towards you in compassion today. Where you are, as you are. Not by getting yourself ready, not by doing good works, not by bringing merit, not pre by pretending that you're worthy, but just that Jesus is the Savior of sinners. Run to Christ today in repentance and faith. And receive this gift, this merciful provision. Because He is full of mercy. He is also a faithful high priest. Jesus doesn't move toward you and, and then discover something ugly about you and back up. Yet the scripture describes Jesus as the one who put his hand to the plow and never looked back. He went all the way to the cross. He drank the cup of sorrow to its bottom. He never stopped. There was never any lack of faithfulness in all of his obedience and in all of his accomplishment of redemption. He is the faithful high priest. And why do I care? Because the mercy of Christ is of little value apart from his faithfulness. 
He may be oriented toward you in compassion and see your need, but if he's not the faithful redeemer who accomplishes all that God sends him to do in the plan of redemption, then his mercy is of no value to you. So thanks be to God, I'm here to tell you the good news is that Jesus is not only merciful, he's also faithful. He is the high priest who can actually bring you to God and you'll not be destroyed. He carries out all of God's commands on your behalf. He accomplishes everything God demands of you. And he does it faithfully with absolute perfection. And so this is the way God is oriented towards you. He receives the weakest and the least and the vilest offender who believes on him. And how can he do anything other when he has come to make propitiation for your sins? What a Savior. Not only that, he's our perfect friend in temptation. Verse 18 says, Jesus is the one who has suffered when tempted, and he is able to help those who are being tempted. Chapter 4, verse 15 also tells us that we have a high priest, not one who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So I'm here to tell you that temptation is not sin. Yielding to it is, but being tempted is not sin because Jesus has been tempted. And temptation, then we understand it as an expected part of this life. And we're called to respond to it as we journey and as we suffer, as we walk under the difficulty of the brokenness of this life. We respond to him by looking to him in time of need. Now, there are three objections that I'd like to address about Jesus as understanding temptation. The first of those is that Jesus wasn't really tempted like we are because he's God and he can't sin. You know, it's kind of like me thinking, well, it's no big deal that Usain Bolt runs really fast. He's really fast. It's no big deal that Jesus was perfect. He's perfect. And in his deity, that's true. But in his humanity, Jesus, as was the first Adam before the fall, is a human being able not to sin when tempted. So where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. And in his humanity, he was surrounded by and affected by every temptation that you or I could face. And yet... He does it without sin. You might go on and say, well, then Jesus never experienced sin, and therefore he can't fully identify with me. I've heard people say that, you know, unless you've walked where I walk, you just really can't understand my situation. And since Jesus has never walked in any sin, how can he understand the situation or identify with, in a real way, any sinner? Hopefully you understand the danger in thinking that. Because if Jesus were to experience sin, now he's no longer qualified to be the Savior. So if you want a Savior who can identify with your sin by sinning, you'll never have a Savior. Because your Savior will always need saving himself. If Jesus had done that, he would have been unacceptable to come to our aid. You and I need one who identifies with us in our humanity in every respect except sinning. And that's who Jesus is. And then you may object, well, Jesus doesn't know really what temptation's like because he's never fallen into temptation. I can see how you might think that. You can say that Jesus really doesn't know how powerful temptation is. But in reality, Jesus has paced the power of temptation that you have never known. Jesus has tasted the full blast of temptation's power, whereas you have not. Because when you were tempted, you fell. You gave in. Picture it like this, if you will, for just a minute. Okay? Think about the hurricanes we've been experiencing and how much of a sustained wind in a hurricane can you stand up in? 40, 50, 60 miles per hour? I've seen pictures of people standing in 80 mile an hour sustained winds. But 
hurricanes can reach a force of upwards of 200 miles an hour of sustained wind. And I'm saying that there's no way on God's green earth that you could ever stand up in a 200 mile an hour wind. You've never stood against the full force of a hurricane. But Jesus has stood against everything temptation can bring and he has not fallen. And so, he not only identifies with you in your, man, your humanity, but he knows exactly where you are walking. He knows exactly the difficulty of your temptation and much more. And he is precisely the Savior we need because we have fallen and he has not. So our best help is not from another who's sinner who sits across the room from us in a support group. As encouraging as other sinners can be. I want to grant that. But that is not the real need. We need a Redeemer who has never sinned. And this help comes from Him who has endured Himself, but even more that, has died to remove the penalty of sin and then been raised in victory over the very sin that brings death. So in this way, Jesus helps you. He has forgiven the sin of your past, your present, and your future. And He is with you to empower you to fight and overcome temptation. So, the Apostle Paul says, the dominion of sin over you has been broken. He who is our merciful and faithful high priest has made propitiation for our sins and he, the victor, is able to help you when you are tempted. And there, friends, is real substance for joy. There is real reason to celebrate. There is reason for lasting and eternal hope. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, as we understand these things, maybe perhaps even just intellectually today, I pray that they would be our experience in the rest of the day. That even as sin raises its ugly head and temptation presses hard against us, that we would run to Christ, the victor over sin, who helps us when we are tempted. And then, even if we still fall again, we run to you, Lord Jesus, because you are a merciful and faithful high priest who is seated at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for us. Help us this day, we pray, Lord Jesus, to bask, as it were, in the, the love and provision and mercy and compassion that you have made for us. Help us to be encouraged by what you have done that is sure and substantial and hopeful. You have removed our past condemnation you have secured our future, and you are helping us as we walk today. To the praise and glory of your grace, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.